Welcome, Welcome everyone to Lessons Learned and Opportunities in IPAC International Development. Today, we're going to hear from our expert consultants on their experiences with international development. We're going to listen to some personal stories along with information on IPAC's work in international development. I think we'll, you will find these stories captivating. First, I'm going to start by giving you an overview of IPAC. I know many of you are familiar with IPAC, so I'll try to be brief. Oops. Okay. So IPAC is Canada's leading organization supporting public administration policy and management. This year we're 75 years old. We're nonpartisan, nonprofit, and independent of government. We are a membership based organization with both individual memberships and institutional partnerships or organizational memberships where a ministry, department, municipality, or corporation can take out a, a membership and be part of IPAC. We contribute to public sector excellence through research and publications, awards, training programs, consultancies, and knowledge networks. The knowledge networks include our conferences, our workshops, and other events, webinar series, such as this webinar, international networks, partnering with organizations, and training programs and consultancies are a big part of what we do. And today we're focusing on the international training programs and consultancies, but we do also do training and consultancies across Canada. Internationally, we've done multi-year programs, short-term projects, short-term projects and study missions, where a group comes from a developing country to learn um, Canadian best practice and Canadian lessons learned. Um, we've worked in Asia, Europe, South America, the Middle East. Uh, we've worked on, in many different areas, including public sector reform, governance, leadership, policy, HR, finance, ethics, et cetera. I think the most important thing to note when we're talking about IPAC's international work is IPAC's approach. The cornerstone of, cornerstones of our approach are recognition, respect, and responsibility. IPAC approaches international development, recognizing the knowledge and capacity of our partners. We don't go in thinking we know everything and they know nothing. Our technical assistance is built on local knowledge and capacities. We respect the identity of our partners and the identity is fundamental in designing our programs. Uh, we also look at the responsibility of all the partners. IPAC aids the beneficiaries in developing programs or uh, training, et cetera. And it's a shared responsibility and a shared ownership. And this ensures real success. Many other um, countries or organizations that deliver international development doesn't always have that approach. They may come in thinking they know everything or they know what's best. And, that's not our approach. And our approach has been extremely successful. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about my experiences. <laughs> um, I worked in Kenya uh, on a project for three years. Um, I worked with the African Association for Public Administration and management or APHAM as they're well known. Uh, I did training, I helped them set up policies and governance for their organization and their organization supports the public sector in Africa, the way Canada, uh, the way IPAC supports public service in Canada. This is a picture of their board and me. <laughs> And this is when I attended a board meeting and I did a presentation on the work that IPAC was doing with APHAM. Uh, this was a partnership program funded through DFAT-D, which is now known as Global Affairs Canada. And I enjoyed working on that project um, 
I worked with some amazing people. I also worked in Mongolia. Uh, I did leadership and innovation training on the Merit Project with CUSO. I also um, did HR audit training for the UNDP in Mongolia. So Mongolia became independent of the Soviets in the early 90s, and this led to a new constitution in 1992. So uh, they are actually a very new country. In 2019, legislation was enacted in Mongolia to create a merit-based public service. Part of this legislation included the requirement to conduct HR audits. So we did training on HR audits and you'll see uh, the picture in the upper right hand corner is some of the training that we were doing. Uh, that's um, my partner Basha leading one of the uh, sessions. This was really important work creating a merit based public service in Mongolia, and I was extremely lucky to be involved with that and I know you'll hear some more from Maria on this Maria actually helped to um, develop the legislation. I also worked in Tanzania, I did leadership change management and innovation training for the Tanzania Public Service College, which is similar to our Canada School of Public Service here. Again, the participants were extremely enthusiastic and reinforced to me that this was important work for them. When the group that you work with is involved, is this involved, it's extremely fulfilling for the trainer as well, for people like me. Uh, they all, realize that the change is desperately needed. And the upper right hand corner, it's kind of hard to see, but those were some of the people that I trained. And we went for a walk on the beach during our break. <laughs> Lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ghana. In Ghana, I worked with the government of Alberta on a partnership program, and we delivered enterprise risk management training to six ministries while I was there. Uh, Many, many more uh, ministries were trained over the lifetime of the project, but the, while I was working on the project, we trained six ministries. We did both training and workshops with the ministries. And sometimes when you work on these projects, you're lucky enough to make good friends as well. The lower right picture is a um, picture of me and Mercy. And Mercy is the director of international, or sorry, of internal audit at the IIA in Ghana. We've remained friends, and I get to continue to witness the progress that the department's been making through Mercy. So on the uh, left-hand side, there is a picture of the, the IIA, so the internal audit group that was working with us. And uh, there's a picture of Colleen from the government of Alberta. Berta and myself with this group. <clears throat> so I really, I can't put into words, I can't tell you how valuable and rewarding this work is. How for me to see the changes and progress of a democratic government in a developing nation is an amazing thing. So now I'm going to introduce to you our pan panel of speakers who will talk about their work and their experiences. Please type your questions into the Q&A and we'll make time for the questions at the end of the presentation. That includes where to send your information if you're interested in exploring international development work with IPAC. So I'm going to introduce all three speakers and then I'll call on them one at a time. First, we have Akeen Alaga. He was born in Canada, but raised in Nigeria. Akeen is a principal in Liberator, a Canadian strategy finance and intelligence firm focused on emerging markets in Africa. Recently, Akeen supported the Institute of Public Administration of Canada with the Economic Advice for Youth Leadership Enterprise Access and Development, or known as ULEAD. We like to shorten the names of these programs, they're often quite long. ULEAD was a five year, 15 million international development project aimed at creating jobs and entrepreneurial opportunities for youth in Africa. 
Prior to Liberator, Akeen had held several, sorry, Akeen held senior management and executive roles in the government in Canada, including his role as director for clusters and regional economic strategies. He also was a management consultant at the Canadian office of a top tier global consulting firm where he held management and global roles, including leading projects in Africa. He has a BA in political science from McGill University and an MBA in strategy and finance from the Rotman School of Management in the University of Toronto. Next is Neil and Betty. Neelam is of Kenyan origin and, and was edu sorry, educated at Make Rare University, Uganda, Imperial College and Michigan State University in the US. He has over 30 years, I know he doesn't look that old, but he has over 30 years of public policy experience in connecting the dots across disciplines and sectors, including trade, environment and social policy in Africa Canada, Latin America, Asia, and the Middle East. Neelam has worked on numerous projects for public and private organizations such as the Rockefeller Foundation, the World Bank, the United Nations, where he was chief of the technical cooperation program in the 13 countries within the Western Asia region. Within the academic setting, he was a visiting scholar in India, focusing on diverse capacity building projects in collaboration with academic, public sector, and industry partners. Within Canada, he has developed and de delivered leadership training sessions for executives from many countries, including IAS officers from India, deputy ministers from Sri Lanka, cabinet secretaries from several African countries through Asami, among others. Neelam is also active in community work that includes the Habitat for Humanity, and Rotary International. He was the president of the Toronto Eglinton Rotary Club and chair of the club's foundation, engaging in projects to improve the lives of indigenous peoples, youth, the homeless, and other marginalized segments of the community. He is co-chair of global grant projects for water and sanitation across 10 schools in Uganda. He is also participating in Hand Wash, one of the Rotary's largest wash programs being delivered in Haiti. And actually, Neil and I just finished working on a project for Lesotho this year. Maria Barados is, a retired from, is retired from the Public Service of Canada. She was president of the Public Service Commission of Canada for eight years, and prior to that served as the Assistant Auditor General at the Office of the Auditor General of Canada. Maria serves on a number of boards and advisory committees. Currently, she is treasurer of the Rothwell Heights Property Owners Association and chair of Alterna Savings and past chair of Alterna Bank. She has maintained her research interests in audit, performance management, evaluation, and statistical analysis, and con continues to write on these topics. She holds positions at Carleton University as executive in residence at the Sprott School of Business and as adjunct, adjunct research professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Maria has a PhD in Sociology from Carleton University, an MA from McGill University, and an honors BA from the University of Saskatchewan. As you can see, we have three very notable uh, speakers today to talk about their, to talk about their experiences and things that might be of interest to people uh, who are interested in starting into or continuing their career in international development. So I'm going to call on Akeen first. Akeen, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Suzanne. I'm really excited um, to be here to talk about uh, my uh, experience in working with IPAC. Let me just share my screen. Um, wait, here we go. So, you know, um, one of the reasons I'm really excited to talk about my experience is because um, someone once told me that um, 
most of the important things in your career could never be planned. You just you just can't plan them. And I think this story um, kind of really highlights that. I grew up in, in an OPS in an Ontario Public Service where a lot of my mentors, like Victor Severino, who just retired, and Mahmoud Nanji, they were doing a lot of glamorous travel or what seemed like glamorous travel to me at the time around the world on volunteer IPAC projects. Um, and that was just the general context. So it kind of, I grew up kind of thinking that that's the kind of thing you aspire to and it looked glamorous and so on. But I also had a general interest in entrepreneurship, no clue about what I wanted to do in that regard. And in Africa, because as you, as Susan kind of highlighted, I'm half Nigerian. And um, I ultimately left the OPS and went into Deloitte's uh, consulting practice and ended up doing a project in Nigeria. And um, you know, after about a decade or so, when I left Deloitte, I was going back to the OPS. Uh, some of the partners asked me what I missed most uh, about Deloitte, and I talked about you know one of that one of that project I did in Nigeria, and and I was and I was you know I was I was advised to take a look at IPAC again, and you know and those volunteer opportunities. Um, it had been you know a decade in consulting. I still had no clue about what I wanted to do in terms of entrepreneurship. Um, so here's what I'm doing today. Right, so that's the background. Here's what I'm doing today. I'm doing, uh, you know, I, I'm a principal, a liberator. You know, one of the projects that really takes up most of my time is this new brand that we launched called This Is African. It's a social entrepreneurship brand um, where we're looking to kind of um, have an impact, uh, a social impact in Africa, but also, you know, make money at the same time. So that's that's what I'm doing. And here's the story of the journey. Right, it all really started. Um, when I saw a, a volunteer IPAC opportunity around 2014, 2015, advertised to develop a green economy, a green economic strategy in Nigeria over three years. Um, I applied and I didn't get it. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe you know, the, the moral of the story is don't be disheartened if you don't get it, right? Um, I applied, I didn't get it, um, but about a about a year later, I got a call asking if I was still interested in joining the team, and I jumped at it. Um, you know, so you know, what's next is a, a couple of pictures. Um, it it was it was to do this project uh, where we were trying to preserve one of the largest rainforests in 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 Africa and West Africa. Um, by developing a green economy. And it was in a part of the country, a part of Nigeria that I, I'd, I'd never been to before. Um, but was, as soon as I got there, I, I just fell in love with the place. It's got one of the most, some of the most beautiful places in Nigeria. So here's a, a few pictures of, of the project. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, of a building really uh, of um, the State Planning Commission, which was our our primary um, our primary Sorry, contact. Sorry, Akeen, your slides are not moving. Just to let you know. At all. It's still on the first slide. Okay. It moved now. Oh, I think there's just a bit of a lag. Um, okay. So. I think it was just a bit of a lag. There you go. So here's a picture of of the um, of the state planning uh, commission building. This is where we spent a lot of our time. Um, this is the next slide. I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, this is a picture of some members of the team. This was our our fearless leader at the time, who was the leader of IPAC, uh, Rob Taylor, along with to his right um, the gender expert. Uh, uh, Regan and and uh, to, to his left um, to my, is uh, the chief economic advisor of the state. Um, the project really got a lot of profile while we we're out there. So this next slide just has you know TV cameras. You know they always wanted to talk to Rob. Um, this is you know some more pictures of Rob with uh, the the project was delivered with Kuso International and next to Rob over there is the head of uh, the Nigerian Kuso as well as you know, government officials um, in, in, in Nigeria. So again, that's the chief economic advisor and somebody who's uh, similar to uh, a secretary of cabinet role and a politician there. Um, that's, that's me in this next picture. I'm not sure if you can see it, but one of the great things I loved about the project was my ability to be able to wear my ni traditional Nigerian outfits. And that's me in one of them. 
um, you know, some pictures of us with with uh, with doing some stakeholder consultations to really get a sense of how how emphatic um, Nigerians can get from that picture. Rob, again, we did a lot of training and offered certification, and that's Rob giving some some certificates out. Um, a greenhouse out here, you know. Um, here I am with uh, the team again. That's Rob, a politician, another member of the team who was uh, the natural resources expert and the CUSO representative. This was a stakeholder consultation that we did in a rural area. I'm from Nigeria and I've been to many different parts of Nigeria and I had never been to an area that was this rural. I had never seen um, a village. Sorry, uh, Akeen. Um your slide hasn't changed from that right. last one. Um, yeah. You may have to put it in uh, slide mode. It is it's in showing. Slide mode. Yeah. Well, what's showing is the all the slides down the side. So maybe you're in the wrong. Okay. Sorry about that. We move now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not doing anything. It's just I, it seems to be some kind of lag. Sorry no. about that. Let's let's try a new share. Okay. We got a lot of um, comments because people are really interested to see these. Uh, right, slides. right, right. Sorry about that, folks. Um, this other, I'm not sure if you can see it, but this, this picture here is um, with our public um, consultations expert. We're doing a public consultation here. And here's the banner that really kind of captures the partnerships that were involved. So IPAC, CUSO, you know, uh, Meta, um, Global Affairs Canada, give you a sense of that. And then here is, here is um, you know, one of the places I talked about that was not too far from where we were delivering the project. Has nothing to do with the project, but I went to go visit. It's a mountain out there. And um, this is a picture you probably don't want to miss um, because uh, in the background, um, you've got some things poking out and they look like islands, but it's really the tops of mountains poking up above clouds. So this is about 5,000 feet in the air, incredibly beautiful, super rural. It's a beautiful part of the country. Um, so, you know, um, I, so, so, so what's interesting about this journey and how it evolved was um, it started out as a volunteer opportunity um, but I ended up, you know, volunteering to take on additional tasks that were outside the scope of the project, right? And some of those tasks turned into paid opportunities uh, and opportunities to travel uh, back to Nigeria, doing things that were a little bit outside of the scope of the, uh, of the initial contract. And one of those tasks was to develop a social entrepreneurship um, competition. Right, and that was really to address some problems we were having in delivering the project and getting buy-in, and social impact and social entrepreneurship. That was an entirely new field for me, but uh, I developed that proposal, and um, ultimately it went nowhere. Um, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the the leadership in Cuso changed, and you know, new leadership wasn't as interested in in this idea on how to address that problem. And so I had that proposal it was about 60 or 70 pages sitting, you know, um, on my desk somewhere um, and it didn't go anywhere. And I talked about it with some friends of mine and we decided to do it ourselves. So we funded it here. So this slide here is I'm not sure if you can see this. Uh, it's just a promotional material for when the following year, like I developed that uh, proposal in 2017, 2018, we launched it. We did it ourselves. Um, a business competition where we were awarding winners uh, investments, and um, ultimately one of those investments, and you know, ended up being um, this is African and a couple of other ones. And so that's 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 really the link between um, this IPAC opportunity and what I'm doing today. I left my job in the uh, government of Ontario to do that work with Liberator with all the winners of of that competition in Nigeria. So I'm getting the two minute sign here, but um, you know, so, so my lessons learned was that it was a huge opportunity to give back um, in, in settings that really have a, they really benefit from, from this type of work. Um, it was an opportunity to stretch and learn and gain new perspectives, develop new expertise and new networks. 
um, experience travel to areas, you know, that you probably might never otherwise have ventured, you know, and, and you know, um, enjoy the whole adventure. And then, you know, it, it, it does offer the opportunity to open up fundamentally different career development windows. And, uh, and that was my experience. And, uh, it, you know, it was, it was essentially a, a life changing experience. Thank you. Thanks, Akeen. Uh, next up, if you could stop sharing, Akeen. Uh, next up is Neelam with his presentation. Neelam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm uh, pleased to be uh, invited to speak here because IPAC and I go a long, uh, way, uh, a long time ago. And as I begin, and we saw some wonderful uh, pictures from Akeen, and I think we probably didn't pay enough to see all of them. Hopefully we can uh, cough up our uh, dues and uh, uh, fascinating uh, uh, journey that Akeen has had. And my own background, I'll give you a bit of a, a sense so that you know the perspective that I'm speaking from. Now, my early journey was actually from Kenya. I went into international development at the get-go. My first degrees were in agricultural economics and international development. And I ended up working with the World Bank, uh, the Institute for Development Studies in Kenya. And uh, later on, what happened was due to personal circumstances, uh, ended up in Canada. And uh, so here I had to apply all my uh, graduate learning and economic analysis, research, et cetera, uh, to the Canadian public sector. Uh, and so it was really transferring all those very portable skills into uh, studying Canadian public policy. Uh, I worked in numerous uh, files here from natural resources to transportation, to local government, the cabinet office, and got involved in uh, you know, the key processes such as uh, results-based planning, evaluation, risk management. And I see a number of people here signed in from the OPS and they're probably familiar with that. But international development was always in my blood. And so there were opportunities even while at the OPS, I was involved in uh, a program in Zimbabwe and then some others. But I kept my affiliation with IPAC uh, very strong because IPAC has been the foremost public policy uh, think tank in a way, uh, in a practical sense. And my first uh, affiliation with IPAC was I was asked to develop a series of national roundtables on performance measurement. And this was in the 80s. And uh, IPAC and the KPMG Center for Government, and we partnered. And so that was mostly looking at uh, public policy in a Canadian sense. Uh, but as, we, as I've gone through that, and I'd like to make a comment on the international development landscape, how I have uh, seen that changed. Uh, we all know international development, but I think in, within Canada, we look at it with, uh, at an arm's length. The theory and philosophy has changed. You know, it uh, started out, you know, the Marshall Plan in the 1940s was a big, the World Bank getting involved in Europe with mega bucks. And then it translated in the 1960s into the international development philosophy. Uh, really, it was considered as uh, well-to-do countries uh, giving money to the less well-to-do countries. And over the years, that has changed now it's much more inclusive. Uh, the actors have changed. There used to be the multilateral and the bilateral uh, actors. And now you have lots of NGOs, private uh, uh, funds, communities. And so in this case, the, uh, the whole notion of aid has changed from a broad-based to targeted and cause-driven. And Suzanne was right in terms of even looking at IPAC. And IPAC, 75 years old, it is all as old as the United Nations, uh, 75 years. Uh, but what's happened in the meantime is uh, the philosophy having been changed, the uh, strategic development goals are now kind of the universal. 
And if I could uh, share my screen here briefly, uh, can I do that, uh, Aaron? Yeah, you can. Okay. Now, if you look at the st street, uh, can you see this? The, uh, I think the audience is probably familiar with the strategic development goals and their rankings. And Canada itself probably is way down at around 29, uh, I believe. But I w this is not the time and uh, place to go into that. But the point that I'd like to make is that, you know, the strategic development goals are universal. And we are all part and parcel of that. And every country is there. But when we think about development, a lot of the development efforts are being framed by the SDGs. Now, Canada does great overall. And when it comes down to quality education, et cetera, but we have our own challenges. So the point, and in your own time, I would encourage you to go take a look at that. And you can poke by goal by goal, there are 17 different goals and there are over 160 targets that the world has agreed to change the world by 2030. And the point being that we all can learn from each other. So whenever I have been involved in some of the, I'll talk uh, briefly about some of the, my IPAC projects, the study missions that uh, Suzanne talked about. And you know, we've had hundreds of them come over. And I recall a couple of incidents and I was taking them down to uh, a local community health center. And the attendees, uh, I think these were a delegation from India and they were doing the mental math in their mind to Excel sheets and they didn't need Excel sheets. And they said, how much is being spent here? And the answer really confounded them. They said, with this amount of money, we could supply healthcare to hundreds of thousands of people and your client group is S. So that got something thinking and the CEO of this health center started engaging in uh, talks and they said, uh, so they carried an off the line conversation. And today I hear that some of the innovations happening in India are being utilized in Canada. So this is the other lesson from uh, us involved in uh, international development is that it's not a one-way stream. Uh, also, it, uh, the world has changed from just being kind of a transfer of dollars or knowledge and institutions. And as Suzanne mentioned, it is more about capacity building and what is capacity building? And that is a multifaceted, uh, uh, kind of uh, aspect, you know, it involves people, processes. And I know Maria will talk about the evaluation part of that. That has become a critical part of uh, all development. All agencies are required to be self-critical. Uh, you know, they look at what works, what didn't work, and what could have been done better. So those are some of the th things. And those attending this uh, webinar, and uh, you probably are from different backgrounds, but I'll tell you my own example. I uh, have has been involved in some mega projects like the Kenyan Special Rural Development Project, which was a comprehensive pre-planned. There were about six different donor groups and they were almost like let the games begin competing against each other. Now, 30 years later, that doesn't happen. Things are much more driven by the local government, local, not only the government, but the local uh, communities. They want to be part of it. We have activist communities. They can request information about every project funded by the UN or the World Bank uh, to under freedom of information. So in that sense, the landscape for both uh, uh, you know, the providers and the actors has changed. So in this sense, I think international development work is no longer something which is the purview of those just trained in that. So people who have a skill to offer uh, become, as Akin mentioned, uh, involved voluntarily. And my life also has changed in terms of putting that on a voluntary basis to, with the Rotary people. I don't know how many of you know about that, but that again, as a service organization, is involved in global grants and polio, health, maternal child, uh, and health. And so those are some of the, so the opportunities are boundless. 
And I think this is just a thumbnail sketch of uh, kind of my journey in there. And I know in the interest of time, I'd like to leave some time for questions uh, so we can get back to those. So I, I don't have any more pictures to add. And I think Maria will be showing you some interesting ones. Thanks so much, Neelam. Uh, we'll move now to Maria. Uh, thank you very much, Suzanne, and hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to listen to the previous uh, presentations. Um, my, my perspective is a little bit different uh, in that I do have a career that always had a real interest in how people and societies and their cultures functioned. Uh, not by accident, I trained in sociology, so that sort of fits. So maybe you can just take off that first slide and, um, and just I'll talk for a few minutes and then do my, my slides later. Right, thanks. Um, and I, uh, just as a comment, I didn't take it upon myself to change slides myself because I knew I'd mess it up. But um, so I, I, I will just make some comments and then I'll show you some pictures. Um, uh, throughout my career, and I, 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 what I was going to say was that I didn't actually start in international development, but I always had this general int interest about people, cultural societies, how they worked. Uh, and, but I sort of backed into international development in a way. So my career, as Suzanne described, uh, was with the Federal Public Service. And one of the places that I was working was the Office of the Auditor General, and you would have an interesting conversation with parliamentarians who would always want to know, well, what is it like in another country? And as an auditor, you tend to be more critical, right? You're talking about areas that could be improved. And they'd say, well, what about other countries? How are they doing that? And the opposition would want more bad stuff and the government would want to say how good we were, uh, which drove us actually <clears throat> at the Auditor General to do comparative work. And I love doing that um, because you could look at a practice, you could compare the practice, but the comparison didn't make any sense unless you really took a good look at the traditions, the, the practices itself, and then the setting in which it occurred. So then you can make a judgment about what could apply, what could not apply, what lessons could be learned. That tended to be in developing countries or the G7 countries. But when I went to the Public Service Commission, there I had a lot of visitors and they were from developing countries, developed countries, uh, and they all wanted to know the same thing. Like, how do we protect merit? How do we have a merit-based public service? How do we keep politics out of the public service? Not all of them wanted that, but many of them wanted that. How do we keep politics out of the public service? How do we professionalize? How do we protect integrity? Uh, how do you choose good people? And interesting enough, one of the countries that wanted to have the most information about how you chose good people was China. And this was the Communist Party. They wanted to know how you got and were able to assess skills to get the right people in the right spots. So that was really how my relationship with Mongolia, which is sort of a little case study that we're going to talk about, and Suzanne already talked about <clears throat> some of the work in Mongolia. That's how it started, because I had the uh, president of the Civil Service Council, which is sort of a parallel organization, the Public Service Commission, come to visit me. And I had many visitors. I'm a domestic organization. I wasn't doing any international work unless I had the stamp of approval from Global Affairs. Um, and, and the president of the Civil Service Council, Sumbral Khan, very, 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 very charming individual, uh, ended the co conversation by saying, well, you must come and visit to Mongolia. It's such a beautiful country, you'd love Mongolia. So as I said to everybody, I'm sure you've got a beautiful country and I would love to come, but you know, only if I can. It was always only if I can. Uh, and my mind was saying, well, Mongolia is sort of far away. I'm not sure that sort of fits in what I'm supposed to be doing. And I was a domestic organization, right? My responsibilities were in Canada, Canada alone. Uh, so I, um, I, I, I did develop that relationship and it started for two big reasons. One was, the ambassador, Canadian ambassador in Mongolia, knew that I was going to China, and this was something Global Affairs wanted me to do. So I was going to China with a group, leading a group, and she argued and said, look, you go to Beijing, you're a, oh, just an hour's flight away from Ulaanbaatar, take a few days, please come and visit us, they'd be so keen to hear about you. Well, we did. 
uh, we did that. And it was a whirlwind trip, but it was something that really sort of got the relationship going between, between the two organizations. Uh, the other thing was that when I retired, I really wanted to do something that wasn't Ottawa based because there's nothing worse than having people still part of the scene and criticizing and commenting because you're in the papers a lot and stuff, making comments about your successors. Bad, bad policy. You know, you gotta get out of the way, <laughs> gotta get out of the way, let them do their thing. So Mongolia was perfect. It was a little far, but it was perfect. Uh, I was very busy, very engaged, and it wasn't on something that was very domestic. Uh, just another comment about how this work was done. This work was funded, uh, so it was funded through um, CETA at the time, but the Development Arm of Global Affairs, and uh, currently UNDP. Now, <laughs> my colleagues have more expense, more experience with the developing uh, scene, but I, I found the developing agencies really, really hard to deal with, and thank goodness I could deal with IPAC. So IPAC was the one who would make all the arrangements. They would satisfy all the requirements. They would do the bidding process, whatever they needed to do, they would do that. And then they would just tell me what I had to do to fill in the bits. So I could concentrate on the substance of what I was doing and I didn't have to worry about the bureaucracy. So I was really, really grateful for them. And it was just perfect because it let me focus on what I really wanted to do was deal with the people on the subject matter I didn't want to deal with all the bureaucracy of it. Now, I mean, sometimes P would take me aside and say, look, there's no way when you travel, you've got to travel under these contracts that we have the cheapest way possible. I did one flight economy, cheapest seat on a 747 from Frankfurt to Beijing and then on to Ulaanbaatar and said never again in my entire life, this will kill me. So I did earn some money doing this and a lot of that went back to the airlines. So I traveled in comfort, was able to go back and forth every six weeks. I got lots of airline points, but that way, you know, I was, I was still in one piece, kept good health while I was doing all of this. So some of the prerequisites of thinking of if you wanna do this kind of stuff, which I encourage anyone to think about, be sure that you do have something to share. Like, you know, you have a passion, you should have a passion for something to share. because. Otherwise, it's not very beneficial for them. I think you have to be interested in other culture and other people. Uh, there's going to be traditions and practices that will be a little bit uh, surprising, and I'll describe some of that to you. Um, but, you know, that's part of it. And you have to be open to those things. Uh, if you're not, don't, don't do this kind of stuff. And you have to be prepared to try and understand their point of view and what it is they're trying to do before you come up with your suggestions and comments. So you understand how it fits, how it could benefit. And sometimes they have to hear about your experience and say, you know, you don't want to do it that way. So, you know, that's, that's the thing I think you have to have. So a bit about Mongolia and what I'm going to do is just to give you a little bit about the project, just a bit, uh, and then I'll show you some pictures because I got the feeling from the Mongolians, there's a lot that relates to our First Nations people. It can't be two minutes already, Susan. I can't talk about Mongolia, except, well, let me say, we drafted the legislation for public service reform, if anyone who wants to know about it. It took many years, but they have it. Now I'm going to go to my pictures because otherwise you won't get the sort of the key thing. And my comment about, the, about uh, the pictures, I don't have pictures of meetings, lots of meetings, lots of TV interviews, lots of newspapers, lots of training sessions, but this is my only formal picture. And this was, I was in Mongolia in January. It was minus 40, bitterly cold. The streets were terrible to walk on, they were icy. The pollution was the worst in the world, but it was my birthday. And the prime minister of Mongolia had me for lunch and presented me this huge bouquet of flowers on my birthday in Ulaanbaatar. So that's me and the Prime Minister of uh, Prime Minister Backbolt. That's the only formal picture. So now we'll just sort of run through some of the others. Okay, can we go? So this is Zumbral Khan, my, my friend and colleague who was part of the, who was the chair of the Public Service Council at the time. So next, just to give you an idea, this is outside of Ulaanbaatar. I'm not showing you pictures of the city. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a city that has a weak infrastructure, too, too many people, 
doesn't function very well, but this is outside. Notice, no fences, only one road you see. If you wanna go anywhere, you just go where you wanna go, you just drive. So next, one of the things you can do when you are in a region that you're from, so Zumbrilcam was in the region where we were from, you can go to any herder, any gear, knock on the door and they'll invite you in. So I forgot the picture of the gear, but I'll have one coming up. So this is a herder. Uh, this is the horses, his herd of horses. And what they, again, no fences, notice. Uh, next picture. And this is what they're doing. They're milking the horses. So you get one little cup of all that work of mil milking a horse. Next picture. And then they invited us in to have fermented mare's milk. So this is the inside of a gear. Everything, they, their whole family lives right there. Uh, and we have fermented mare's milk. It is an acquired taste. Now I have my grandson with me, Sumbra Kam and myself. I drank, they give you a big bowl. I drank half of it. My grandson couldn't quite do it. But you know, you're thinking the whole time, one little cup from one horse, and this is very precious for them, uh, but they were sharing. Uh, every gear, they move around as needed when, it, when, when they don't have enough grass and ground gets too soiled, they move along. Uh, every gear has a satellite dish, and so they do have some electricity, some television. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is countryside, a Karen in the countryside, move on. Yes, next. Camels, herd of camels. Again, no fences, no roads. Uh, about a quarter of the population are still nomadic. Next slide. Um, so we were there for the Natam Festival, which is the big summer festival, and um, being treated with great hospitality. Hos hospitality. So here, more food. Next slide. One of the traditions is they share bottles of scent and they, I never quite figured it out because you know I didn't always have good translation, but they, they share this as one of the things that men do. So I never quite got it being one of the women. Uh, next slide. Now, uh, what they do is for special visitors, and I guess I was one, they give them a horse. You get, you get a gifted a horse. And here we are in the countryside waiting for the horse to appear. Uh, now, I'd heard a lot about these horse gifts because they, they were telling me that if you got a horse, you had to pay for the upkeep of the horse, which is a little worrisome. I'm not into horses, but anyway, this was honorific, so we're standing here waiting for the horses. Next slide. The horse didn't come, <laughs> so I was relieved. They were a little upset, but that's fine. Next slide. So uh, we left, and we're cross country, right? No road. This was beyond belief that we were actually driving through this. Next slide. And when that was over, you have to pause. No washrooms. I mean, you have to do like the animals. That's the only way you function <laughs> and, and seeing the countryside. Next slide. Uh, so this is again outside of Ulaanbaatar. Next slide. We went to a national park, which is not far. They have a, a herd of wild horses. Of course, everything just winters through these extremely cold uh, winters. Next slide, I see one minute, I'm going real fast. Sand dunes in this, this uh, place. Next slide, it's part of the Gobi Desert, but it's not there. This is Ulaanbaatar, it's, uh, it's a Buddhist country. Uh, so this is part of one of the temple areas. Last slide. So this is Sumbril Kam's gear. So we were invited to Sumbril Kam's house and he has a gear in the backyard. So yurt in, in, in Russian. Uh, and we were hosted there. So Suzanne, that's it. I only talked about 10% of what I wanted to say, not very well organized, <laughs> but I would encourage every, everyone to take advantage of these opportunities and work with IPAC because they'll, they'll, they'll keep you out of trouble on the administrative side. So thank you very much, everybody, and happy to share any further information that people might want. Thanks, Maria. That was uh, a really valuable point about uh, both, uh, I think all of you made about the people doing the consulting, learning as much from the beneficiaries as they were learning from us. Lastly, but not leastly, <laughs> we have Phil Rourke from Co-Water, who's going to talk about some current 
programs we have going and um, opportunities there. So I'll just uh, give you a little bit of background information about Phil. Phil has 25 years of practical experience in delivering professional training courses on trade policy issues and in implementing trade capacity building projects. He's a lecturer in trade policy and trade negotiations at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton and the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa. Currently, Phil is project director for the Canadian Trade and Investment Facility for Development, CTIF, a seven-year technical assistance fund to assist Asia-Pacific developing countries with their trade and development strategy. He's also project director for the Expert Deployment Mechanism for Trade and Development, EDM, a seven-year technical assistance fund to assist Canada's developing country trading partners with the design, negotiation, and implementation of their trade agreement strategies with Canada, which both of those IPAC is working with Coater on. Since 2017, Phil also co-leads the design and delivery of online and in-person trade negotiation skills development courses to UK trade officials in support of the implementation of the UK's post-Brexit trade strategy, which I find quite interesting. Uh, Phil, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, what I'm going to do is look at these issues from a little bit of a different perspective. I'm sitting on a whole pot of money. Um, we get um, requests uh, for that money uh, from beneficiaries. And then we go and look for um, individual consultants and groups of consultants to implement these projects. And yes, we're uh, implementing this jointly with IPEX, so I really welcome um, this opportunity. It's also a good example because uh, here in Canada, Global Affairs has been using this model in other projects as well. The expert deployment mechanism in this case is with trade and development. It also has been looking at EDMs, as they call them, for other uh, areas of uh, policy reform and development. The idea is giving a group, a, a, a firm, um, responsibility for managing a fund according to cer certain guidelines uh, that are consistent with the feminist international assistance policy and then finding um, individuals to implement those those pieces so in terms of opportunities um, there's two uh, that i'm uh, that i serve as a project director one is the uh, edm for trade and development this is a $16 million fund. And as um, Suzanne was just describing, this one is a global fund and it's focused on helping those countries with whom Canada is either negotiating or implementing uh, trade uh, agreements in the developing world. So it's a global fund. We follow very much the mandates of the trade minister and the foreign minister and the development minister in terms of the direction uh, of this program. So in this case, um, the, the priorities for the trade minister um, is the Asia Pacific uh, region and uh, specifically ASEAN as a grouping, Indonesia, uh, the TPP countries that we just signed an agreement with that on the developing country side, that's Vietnam and Malaysia and India. And sorry, and then in the Americas, we work in Colombia, Peru, uh, and Paraguay, and could be looking at other places as well, and some uh, discussion about working in Africa in the future. Here are a few examples of the kind of projects that we do. They're relatively small projects, very targeted, uh, and very focused on some technical expertise that the uh, beneficiary is requesting. In this particular area of uh, development, lots of the expertise is already in the countries themselves, within the ministries, within outside of the ministries, in the private sector, in the NGO sectors. What they don't have uh, always uh, sometimes is the capacity or the opportunity to talk to people who have had different experiences, to figure out how or gone through it in a similar way, to figure out how to do it. And so they ask us for short uh, interventions of six to nine months to help them figure out certain problems that they're trying to address within their organizations. So here you see, for example, in Peru, helping 
the trade ministry with their with their negotiations. Uh, working in Colombia with um, looking at uh, making sure that that agriculture meets certain standards so that it can actually be exported into another country. In the ASEAN region, we're looking at a whole bunch of issues um, that ASEAN countries are thinking about as they prepare for formal negotiations with Canada on a, a free trade agreement between Canada and the region and the um, regional organization. The second fund that I sit on is, uh, is focused on Asia Pacific countries and as opposed to a global fund. And it's more focused on the enabling environment uh, for trade and development rather than the specific issues related to negotiation and implementation of trade agreements. And so here we're looking at helping uh, uh, national governments, regional organizations, civil society organizations in uh, achieving their trade and development objectives. For this, again, a whole variety, uh, and in fact, even more variety of kind of uh, projects that we would look at, um, strengthening capacity of gender responsive governance in Fiji, looking at climate change issues for uh, small and medium sized enterprises throughout the Asia uh, ASEAN region, uh, looking at waste and to energy technologies, uh, in uh, Malaysia and a few other universities and uh, countries and universities and the creative industries in the Philippines. These are just four of a portfolio of 15 different projects that we're working on currently. You can find all of them at the website um, ctif.ca and we can send that around if people are interested. In terms of opportunities, uh, we uh, this year EDM has a has a technical assistance budget of a, about a one and a half million. The average uh, project budget is about eighty thousand, so that translates to about sixteen different projects that we're going to be looking for people like you um, to provide bids uh, on these pieces uh, to implement what we're trying to achieve. CTIF has a bit of a different angle to it. Uh, the, the projects are somewhat larger, so the average is around two hundred or so. And the budget's a little larger, so we're talking about eight to ten projects around uh, two hundred and twenty-five thousand over nine to twelve months. Now, uh, what I thought would I give you five quick uh, tips that I've learned, and, and most of you may already uh, know these, but I'm just to emphasize them. And for those who don't, maybe this will uh, get you thinking about these things. What I'm doing here is. Uh, I also serve as an independent consultant, uh, but on these projects, I'm looking at uh, requests to uh, bids uh, from individuals or organizations trying to get the money uh, from us to implement these projects. Here are a few lessons that I've learned as I've looked at them. The competition is intense. We usually get five to seven proposals for each piece of work, including those small ones for $80,000. And each, uh, if you are the winning bidder, you usually win by three or four points. What that means is that you have to be excellent in every area of expertise. What that also means is that if, unless the uh, project is completely designed for your particular expertise, you're going to need help. If you, if you don't specialize and say, well, I'm going to do this little piece, and then I'm going to find somebody else to do that piece, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't do it that way and say, well, this is my area of expertise, but I also know how to do this, this, and this, it's not going to cut it. You're not going to get enough points uh, to win the bid because the others are doing it in a different way. So think about that, specialize. And in fact, specialization um, is the best way to uh, build your your career as an independent consultant uh, in the first place. Figure it out and what distinguishes you from the competition. As you do that, um, my experience, and I've learned from my mistakes a little bit, uh, but my experience is don't keep on thinking about other things that you wanna do. Think about fewer things and going deeper into that. As we've seen, especially at least in the area that I work in, Trade and development, it's a very specialized niche uh, and there's lots of expertise already in the, um, in the developing countries. So you need to be able to squarely fit in that area. And the only way you can do that is continue to work 
and further specialize and deeper in your understanding of how to present them and teach them and reflect on them as, uh, as, as a coach or a mentor. If that doesn't work, and this has happened to me several times, if that doesn't work in terms of getting you enough of the revenue that you're looking for to, uh, to exist as an independent consultant, you will have to reinvent yourself. I think I've reinvented myself professionally four times already. Um, and the, it's like everything else. It, it, it's working, it's working, and but gradually you find yourself um, trying to just keep a little piece as opposed to thinking, well, there's other ways of looking at this. If I, if I can start reinventing myself, and the best way to reinvent yourself is work with someone who has that expertise. Work with them um, on a part-time basis or at a smaller level of effort, and you'll learn from them and you learn from that experience. And as you do that, you can reinvent yourself into another area. As I was saying, um, you are bids are won by 5% or less margin. What this means is you have to partner um, to compete successfully. Only the strongest teams win and you need the best proposals, most innovative solutions to the problems identified to have a chance. I've, I've seen uh, many proposals where somebody keeps on selling the same thing uh, and, and, and thinks that that's going to work. It's not going to work. You're gonna to have to continuously modify and specialize, reflect on it and find if, if you can't compete directly, find a more innovative way uh, to solve the problem because that might give you the chance to um, um, outcompete uh, the established players. And then finally, uh, firms uh, like uh, IPAC, or organizations like uh, IPAC or firms like uh, Cowater are looking for you. Um, successful firms, whether they're large firms like that or, or smaller ones, they're successful because they figured out some of the lessons that I've just described and they figured out we can't do everything, we need other people to help. At the same time, they don't, uh, from a business point of view, um, have enough money or cash flow or opportunities uh, to hire people full time. So what they wanna do instead of to keep their overhead low, but also to be flexible is they want people on short-term assignments to assist them in winning bids and then implementing them. And so you will go to the co-water site and you will see every time they're bidding on a proposal, they will put um, uh, these opportunities on their, their website um, in addition to the ones where they're actually hiring staff. And these, this is how you first get noticed uh, into that kind of uh, business. I'm gonna stop there. Thanks very much. Over to you, Suzanne. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, it seems we've really run out of time for questions. I know there was a couple of questions and we can uh, post the answers on our website with the video of this, this um, presentation. Uh, one of the questions was about um, language. And I know we've all experienced that and yes, people in Mongolia don't speak English. And yes, we had simultaneous translators and it is a bit, um, it is quite a, an interesting situation to be presenting to a group and try to follow your slides that are up on the wall in Mongolian and try to figure out which slide you're on. It's, it's, um, it's an interesting situation, but we will answer the questions in full and post the answers on our website along with the, um, the, the video of this, this uh, presentation, this webinar. So I'd like to thank all the speakers for their support of IPAC and the work that's been done over the last 25 years or more. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor for me and for IPAC to work with these dedicated and passionate experts. Um, so I'm just gonna share quickly some, some information. Uh, IPAC is celebrating its 75th anniversary, as I mentioned. It's September 7th to 9th. Please join us at the Weston Harbor Castle Hotel in Toronto. This will be our first in-person event since COVID. 
but we are also continuing with the virtual option for those who cannot travel. We've got some amazing speakers. We actually have UN Ambassador Bob Ray talking about international uh, issues. So uh, this group who joined for this particular webinar will find that a very interesting conversation. We also have Peter Mansbridge from CBC. Um, public sector leaders from all levels of government across Canada will be joining us to celebrate this 75th anniversary. So for more information, please go to our website, ipac.ca for more information on registering. Lastly, if you're interested in being added to our consultant roster, please send your CV and any other pertinent information to me at spatterson at ipac.ca. I am on the website if you forget my email. Uh, my email is on our website, ipac.ca. And as well, keep an eye out for our 10 uh, job postings. We post consulting, international consulting opportunities on our 10 website. We also uh, e-blast them out with our 10 e-blast every Friday. So if you haven't signed up, to receive our 10 e-blast, please do so if you're interested. And uh, that includes all of our CTIF and the EDM projects with CoWater. So opportunities for consulting that are available get posted on our 10 website and um, get e-blasted out. 10 actually means talent acquisition network. So, um, so please um, sign up, send me your CV and get involved. Thank you very much and have a great afternoon.